Thanks, Rachel. Um, and I must start off by thanking everyone for coming. It looks like we're still having a few people pop in, but um, we'll go ahead and, and get started anyways. Uh, as Rachel already said, my name is Noah Zerbe. I teach in the Department of Politics, and it still sounds weird to say at Kyle Pauly Humboldt um, rather than at Humboldt State. I'm also uh, affiliated with the International Studies Program. I have been for um, as, as long as I've been at HSU, I think. Um, and so the, the topic that um, I, I wanted to talk about today is, is to think about the ways in which uh, our food choices, the food we eat, uh, connects us to the broader world, right? Um, and so if you're anything like me, uh, your day probably started off or may have started off with a cup of coffee. I think about 70% of Americans, from what I read, uh, start their day with a cup of coffee. Um, I had a light breakfast with it, you know, some toast, some homemade jam. Um, but the, this sort of, you know, innocuous breakfast, right? This, this sort of everyday action of, of, of having, starting my day with a cup of coffee, um, connects us, connects me, connects all of us to these broader, uh, economic, political, cultural, environmental questions um, in ways that, that we don't often pause to think about. And so, so that's what I want to talk about today. That's what I want to focus in on is the ways in which these connections, these global connections are all implicated in uh, tea or coffee. You know, I see people talking about drinking tea instead. Tea works the same way, right? I mean, in different regions of the world, but, but largely a, a similar kind of phenomenon. And so um, I'm going to talk about the ways in which our food choices connect us to these broader political, economic, cultural, social, environmental questions. This idea of the, the cup of coffee is, is a way of thinking about the ways we're connected to the world. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the world. Um, it's also one of the world's most widely traded commodities. Uh, according to one source that I, that I picked up on as I was sort of putting this together, gathering my thoughts around this, uh, the world consumes about two and a quarter billion cups of coffee every day. Coffee, tea, you know, whatever you're choosing to drink, you're certainly not alone in, in those decisions and, and, and the ways in which those connect you to the world. My choice or my making coffee this morning, to, my choice to have coffee this morning was the, the final step in a, a massive global commodity chain that transcends many years and literally thousands of miles. Um, the coffee I drank this morning was probably picked from a tree that was planted at least five years ago. That's sort of how long it takes a coffee tree to, to reach uh, maturity so it can fruit. Uh, and it generally lasts somewhere in the order of 20 to 25 years of uh, sort of productive life before you have to start over. The coffee I drank probably was grown in uh, Brazil, Vietnam, or Colombia, which are the three leading coffee producers in the world. Um, and indeed, most of the coffee we consume in the world comes from the world's tropics, uh, where the combination of a particular soil uh, uh, varieties, warm weather, high elevations, all sort of create the ideal growth environment for, for coffee trees. And while there's more than 50 countries that grow coffee, about 85% of the world's total production comes from, from these major growers, and about two thirds of global production comes from just those three countries I mentioned, Brazil, Vietnam, and Colombia. The way in which coffee is grown can vary a great deal from place to place, obviously. Um, we have examples of both sort of large-scale plantation-style production and small-scale family farming production. But what's interesting is that even though we have this kind of variety and where what you know depends on uh, uh, the region in which it grows and, and the, the, the particular kinds of coffees you're consuming, um, about 60%, a little under two-thirds of the world's coffee is actually grown by, by small-scale farmers and about 44% of those small scale farmers of the world's coffee farmers live in poverty. About 22% of them live in extreme poverty. And so coffee production sort of connects us to this global system uh, in which you know, most of this coffee is still harvested by hand, right? It, the berries are still hand picked. And that, that process, that picking of the coffee takes place usually about two months before I actually buy the coffee in the, in the store or uh, in the coffee shop. The farmer who actually picked the coffee, who grew the coffee and picked it, probably earns about a dollar, maybe under uh, $2 a pound, but depending upon global prices, they sort of fluctuate in that range. But if you sort of think about that dollar per pound or that $2 per pound figure, it represents about somewhere in the in the order of about 10% of the final 
coffee price if you buy it in the grocery store or about seven cents on a cup if you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And so for me, a couple of interesting questions come up from this. Uh, the first is, why does the farmer earn so little? If you think about coffee as, as, a, as a sort of a 20 to 25 year investment between the planting of the tree and the, and the final cultivation, uh, why does so little of the, the price of the cup of coffee go back to the farmer who grew it in the first place? And the, the, the sort of corollary question, the second question is, where does the rest of the money go? Where does all the, the, the $5 cup of coffee, where does that, where does that money wind up? Um, and so I think, you know, let's start with the second question first. There's, you have to remember there's a whole host of steps that go into coffee production between me, you know, the final drinker of the coffee and the farmer that grew it in the first place. Uh, there's the processors who once the, the raw coffee berries are uh, collected by the farmer, they're usually sold to a processor who has to remove the seed from the coffee berry. And there's two different ways you can do this. There's a, there's a uh, labor intensive dry method that takes quite a bit of time, about a month to sort of dry the bean out and, and harvest the, the seed, which becomes the coffee bean. Uh, or there's the more capital intensive wet method, uh, which is much faster, but it's also much less environmentally sound because it produces a lot of waste and a lot of uh, uses a lot of water. Once the once the processing is done, the coffee beans are ready to be milled, and this is the stage where the beans are sorted, they're cleaned, they're and they're graded. Um, and the grading of the coffee bean, the, the final sort of quality grade that a coffee bean gets, uh, has a huge impact on the final price that, that the farmer will earn for that coffee. The highest grade beans, grades one and two, command a premium in the global market of up to 50%. And the lowest grades are, are often sold as sort of bulk coffee that's mixed with, with the quality stuff to get something that's roughly drinkable. So you don't earn nearly as much from that. But this process of milling and grading, once that's completed, the beans can then be roasted, packed, shipped and ground into the final product that we buy in the store. And the, this occurs, right? So if the first three stages of, of the production process generally occur close to the site of production, right? To the farm, uh, grinding, packing, roasting, all of this generally occurs close to the site of consumption. And so there, there's a large gap between those two moments Moments. This takes place close to where we buy the coffee because once the coffee is roasted, uh, and particularly once it's ground, it has a relatively short shelf life, right? Most connoisseurs say you've got about three days to drink the coffee once it's uh, processed. After that, um, you know, you can use packing methods to sort of extend that shelf life, maybe up to a couple of weeks, but certainly not more than a month or so before you start noticing a pretty dramatic decline in the quality of the coffee. Uh, and so because of that, that tends to take place in locations much closer to where we, we actually drink the coffee. But once, once that step is done, uh, we're ready to, uh, you know, brew and drink the coffee at home. So that's, you know, sort of the, the framework, the timeline from which coffee reached the farmer to, to, to my, uh, my, my kitchen this morning. According to the National Coffee Association, I'm hardly alone in the fact that I started my day this way. As I already said, about 70% of Americans start their day with a cup of coffee. The average coffee drinker drinks about th two to three cups a day. You know, this is a sort of interesting cultural phenomenon as well. Uh, Dr. Holmes could talk about sort of the, the difference in the British tea habit versus the American coffee habit. And, and it's an interesting sort of cultural dynamic that surrounds those. But there's also a, a, an interesting um, market development kind of phenomenon that's taken place here. In the early 1980s, there was a lot of concern among coffee producers that Americans were moving away from drinking coffee. And so there was a, there was a real sort of sea change in thinking about how to approach coffee from the coffee industry that sort of tried to figure out how can we move Americans away from consuming sugary carbonated beverages and get them to consume more coffee. And, and you know, as, as you sort of might be able to guess that that happened a couple of ways. One was the, the growth in specialty coffees. So higher quality coffees, that grade one coffee that we get and the, the sort of geographic indicators that come with that, like uh, Kona coffee or Java Blue Mountain coffee, right? All of these high end specialty coffees. But the other was to make coffee sweeter, the, the sort of introduction of more sugary alternatives to traditional, you know, coffee and cream or black coffee. Think of 
caramel macchiatos and cafe mochas and, and all of these sorts of special drinks at, at Starbucks. And all of this was successful, right? All of this resulted in this dramatic increase in coffee consumption in, in the U.S. Now, if we, if we sort of step back and look at this timeline, this sort of uh, way of thinking about the various stages of the coffee production process, in addition to the stages I've mentioned here, I, I presented a, a quite a simplified sort of diagram of, of, of how this works. There are, of course, numerous intermediaries and agents and handlers and exporters and, and food inspectors and, and all of these that operate in the intermediate spaces between the stages I've identified here. And of course, each takes a, a slice, if you will, of the final um, price of the coffee. But if we break down that cup of coffee that I had this morning, we find that the, the final retailer captures about three quarters of the total cost that, that I paid for the coffee. So that may be Starbucks and the coffee house if I bought it from a, from a coffee chain, a cup of coffee, or it may be the grocer if I bought a, a bag of coffee from, from a grocery store. But that final retailer captures about three quarters of the total cost of the coffee. About 13% goes to the processor, right? That's the group that, that processes and mills the coffee. Uh, and about 6%, sorry, about 6% to the processor, about 13% to the roaster. About 1% gets tied up in transportation and somewhere between one and 2% goes back to the farmer. So that's that figure that, that I started with. And we can think about coffee as being just one example of this much broader trend that exists in, in sort of global food network. We could actually do the same thing for nearly any food item that we choose to eat. Our food consumption connects us to these global networks, these globalized networks of production. Strawberries and tomatoes from Mexico, red peppers from Chile, grapes from Peru, apples from New Zealand, so on. We can keep going with all of this. A 2018 New York Times report found that about half of the fruits that we consume in the United States and about 40% of the vegetables we eat are imported to the United States, right? So they're produced abroad and brought into the U.S., often from thousands of miles away. And this is relatively simple on sort of the food chain, right? If we're, if we're talking about raw fruits and vegetables, uh, or even coffee, we're talking about goods that are not that processed, they're not that complicated. A much more interesting example might be a taco, which there was a group at the uh, California College of the Arts a couple of years ago that looked at the anatomy of a taco or the distance a taco travels, right? They, they, took a, they purchased a taco from Juan's Taco Truck in San Francisco's Mission District. And when they broke down the ingredients and the sourcing of all of that, they found that the taco that they bought actually traveled a total, the ingredients traveled a total of 64,000 miles to reach that final site, that final moment at which the taco was purchased. Uh, some of the ingredients like the uh, salt and the cheese came from relatively close, you know, right from the kind of broader San Francisco area, but others came from much further afield, right? Uh, avocados from Chile, rice from Thailand, all sorts of examples that were, that were purchased from long distances away uh, and brought to the final moment here of, of consumption, even though there are lots of opportunities to purchase those things much closer to home. Um, California is a major rice exporter. Uh, most of the um, avocados we, we purchase today, as we'll learn in a couple of minutes, come from Mexico. This taco is just one uh, example, you know, perhaps a, a particularly um, interesting example of this broader trend towards kind of global production and consumption in our in our food network. And, and one other example I wanted to share, particularly egregious example that was making its rounds around uh, social media a couple of months ago, was this example of prepackaged pears that were purchased in the United Kingdom, grown in Argentina packed in Thailand, right, and then finally sold in the UK, a total journey for these peaches of more than 25,000 miles, uh, or sorry, these pears for more than 25,000 miles, not to mention all of the excess packaging we increasingly see, uh, pre-peeled oranges, individually wrapped bananas and carrots, uh, pre-washed and pre-cut lettuce, and a host of other food conveniences, all of which exist to make our lives as, as the final consumer a little bit quicker, a little bit easier, but all of which comes at, at a significant environmental and even a public health cost. Such packaging increases dramatically, and I contend largely unnecessarily, the amount of plastics and styrofoam landfills, 
and cross-contamination associated particularly with pre-packaged salads and pre-washed greens and sprouts is a leading vector for salmonella, listeria, and a host of other foodborne pathogens. These general trends are even more intensified in the area of processed foods, which often travel much further distances over greater times and rely on even more packaging than, the, than their less processed counterparts. And don't even get me started on the can of Coke that you see in the image here. I have no idea why someone would feel it necessary to individually wrap a can of Coke, but there you have it. Now, to be clear, the, the, our food in one sense has always been globalized, um, or at least always subject to these kind of tendencies, these forces of globalization. Food crops have spread around the world from their geographic points of origin to such a degree that we often forget that the foods themselves, the foods that we eat often originated uh, and somewhere else and often looked very different before we started domesticating, selecting, breeding, engineering them. Before the first Americans uh, domesticated corn, it was a barely edible um, plant similar in texture to a raw potato. Before carrots became the sort of sweet orange vegetables we enjoy today, they were purple and white roots that forked when they grew in their native Persia. And before the banana became the fruit that we uh, often grab quick for a quick bite today, it was cultivated and bred in Papua New Guinea from a wild variety that was light in fruit and heavy in seed. And similarly, before the, the Colombian conquest and the flow of germplasm and, and, and disease that followed, there was no corn in Africa, there were no potatoes in Ireland, no tomatoes in Italy. Most of the cuisines we think of today as sort of being indicative of particular cultures are the result of relatively recent, at least in kind of broad historical terms, relatively recent globalization of food crops. And even these historical examples had huge cultural, political, and economic implications. Think, for example, about how the introduction of potatoes to Ireland shaped its history, leading ultimately to famine and mass migration, the roots of which led to the, the fact that we can go almost anywhere in the world today and, and find an Irish pub. Similar Similarly, think about how corn was introduced uh, after 1500 to Southern Africa and uh, displacing the, the crops historically grown there, the sorghums and the millets and others, and, and shifting dietary preferences to the degree to which today uh, maize is, is considered a staple crop, particularly across most of Southern Africa, and a crop that's not particularly well suited for cultivation there. The, the point I'm trying to make is that the global spread of food has helped to shape the histories and the cultures. It has impacted global politics and economics in really profound ways that, that still resonate in important ways today. In, in, in sort of more contemporary times, our global food system is often obscured. Uh, and in turn, it often obscures or, or maybe hides our uh, connections to it and our connections to, to each other. It's not just in the kinds of food that we eat that are, have these sort of broad global connections, but it's the actual food we consume today on a daily basis. And I think that this sort of this global system often uh, creates a host of problems or challenges. The idea that the sites of production and consumption are, are distanced from one another often obscures or, or enables obfuscation of distancing of production and consumption often uh, hides the, the kind of broader environmental or social conditions under which production takes place, right? It's easy to ignore or overlook the environmental consequences of production or the inequities in, in the global food system when, the, when we don't see the, the production process itself. Further, there's been, particularly since the early 2000s, a dramatic influx of speculative investment in both land and food. The, the use of futures contracts, right? Futures contracts are essentially uh, agreements to deliver a certain amount of food at a certain price at a particular point in the future. Uh, the use of futures contracts in farming historically were used as a way to mitigate risk, to uh, provide the farmer a guaranteed price for their, for their crops at a particular point in the future so that they could better plan their farming process. They knew how much they could expect to get for the food that they were growing, so they had a sense of how much they could afford to spend on inputs and, and, and other uh, uh, factors of production and still turn a profit at the end of the year. And similarly for processors, 
futures contracts allowed them to lock in a certain amount of delivery at a certain price uh, so that they knew that they would have a, a sort of stable supply over the processing time of the crops that they needed to, to, to keep their uh, uh, processing facilities going. After, two th- after two, the early 2000s, many of the restrictions on speculative investments in agriculture were were weakened. And we saw this massive influx of speculative investment to um, agricultural markets and to land, overwhelming the traditional use of futures contracts as a way to mitigate risk. And as a result, introducing some really dramatic fluctuations in in, uh, pricing over time, uh, really disconnecting what are called spot markets and future markets, and and leading to these wild swings that we see in uh, agricultural prices today or crop uh, prices today. Our global food system has also effectively ended seasonality in our food choices. We no longer have this need to wait until a particular crop comes into season in order to enjoy it, right? Refrigerated shipping containers uh, and new methods of processing allow us to enjoy uh, what were historically seasonal crops year-round. So things like strawberries you can find in the grocery store year-round now, uh, and you don't have to wait until spring to enjoy them anymore. All of this, of course, comes with a, a big environmental impact. According to the UFF, UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, agricultural production accounts for more than 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, with much of that uh, impact concentrated in methane releases from the meat industry. Agricultural production is also associated with eutrophication in oceans, particularly where river uh, rivers flow through agricultural land, uh, drain off nitrogen that's that's put into the soil for uh, in the form of fertilizer, uh, and release it into the oceans, which destroy the the fisheries, uh, the fish habitats there. All of this uh, is normally treated as an externality in the production process and are generally not accounted for in the price of the food, the price that we pay for the food we eat. And finally, as we've already noted, the globalized food system is rooted in, in a highly unequal system of labor, which is both racialized and gendered in particular ways. In the United States, for example, Farm workers are disproportionately migrant laborers and persons of color, and farm owners are disproportionately white. Globally, small farmers tend to be the poorest members of society, and in this sense, the the food system, uh, both production and consumption, is intimately linked to these broader racial, gender, and economic inequalities in both the United States and globally. Returning to my cup of coffee for just a couple of moments, we can see a whole host of these uh, these issues that I've just talked about play out. Um, until 1989, coffee prices were regulated by the International Coffee Agreement, uh, which was essentially an agreement between the world's coffee producers, right, the leading countries that, that grew coffee, and the, the major coffee consumers, the coffees that, the countries that were the biggest coffee importers. What the International Coffee Agreement did was to essentially maintain, uh, through uh, the use of quota systems, price bounds, right, a, a stable price range for coffee producers. Uh, the agreement grew out of a host of earlier agreements that, that actually predate World War II, but it formally came into existence under the International Coffee Agreement in 1962, largely at the, under the leadership of the United States, which feared that uh, unstable or low coffee prices could drive countries towards communism. So this is largely a, 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 um, a question that has to be seen in the context of the Cold War at the time. But the end of the Cold War eliminated that concern for the United States. And so in 1989, the U.S. withdrew from the coffee, International Coffee Agreement, uh, effectively ending the agreement, right? The U.S. Was, was the leading consumer country in the agreement. And so when the U.S. withdrew from that agreement, it effectively led to the breakdown of, of the ICA for all intents and purposes. Immediately after that happened, coffee, produ- coffee prices fell by about 50%. But perhaps more importantly, uh, coffee prices began to fluctuate much more wildly than they had previously. The result of this was was a so-called coffee price roller coaster, where prices would swing wildly up and down from year to year. Farmers were unable to shield themselves from these dramatic price fluctuations, and so they could see record prices in one year, like 1994, where frosts in Brazil and the Rwandan genocide forced global coffee prices much higher, but then quickly collapsed 
perhaps the next year. And as an aside, I'll just point out, this is the, this is the um, average daily price for coffee per pound, but this graph shows the, from 1973 until I think yesterday, but note that this is not adjusted for inflation. And so when we adjust for inflation, real coffee prices today, while relatively high by recent standards, are quite low by historical standards and, and well below the, the peak levels of the early 1970s when we adjust for inflation. The price today is about 250 per pound, uh, but if we convert that back to, to uh, real prices in the 1970s, it was about 50 cents per pound. It would be the equivalent of about 50 cents per pound or about $1.25 per pound in 1994. So uh, that's the impact of inflation. Now, I could have chosen any number of other foods to illustrate this, this tendency, the, these, these challenges in our global food system, uh, some of which we've covered in, in my food politics class this semester. Uh, bluefin tuna pulled from the North Atlantic before being flown to Tokyo sushi markets, fish markets for uh, grading and processing, and then the, the processed fish being flown back to the United States for sale in high-end sushi restaurants in Los Angeles or New York. Uh, we could have talked about avocados uh, shipped from farms in Mexico to consumers in the U.S. ahead of Super Bowl Sunday, or we could talk about the Australian wine industry and Australian wine exports to the United States. And each of these have their own stories and their own implications, some of which uh, are similar to what we've talked about and some of which are very different. For example, if we think about the, the North Atlantic fisheries, we could use that to tell the story of changing tastes and food preferences, right? The rise of the popularity of sushi in the United States. Um, but we could also use that to tell the story of the failure of the United States and the European Union to effectively regulate the over-exploitation of bluefin tuna, a migratory species that moves between the two fisheries. Uh, the story of avocados could tell us about the globalization and, and free trade, challenge of differential access to subsidies. Uh, and more recently, if you've been following the news, uh, the grow growing role of organized crime and the breakdown of uh, food safety inspections in, uh, in the U.S., or sorry, in Mexico by U.S. inspectors, leading to the suspension of avocado imports into the U.S. and a, a forthcoming avocado shortage. And similarly, we could look at the Australian wine industry and think about questions of specialization in trade and the intersection of power politics and, and broader U.S.-China relations in the rise of uh, Australian wine industry. And so all of these seemingly innocuous examples, much like our coffee example, can illustrate the ways in which our food choices connect us to this globalized food system and they highlight the ways in which the interconnected web of our food systems transcend the globe, right? Move around, move around globally. And like I said, we could have chosen any number of other examples. We could have looked at tea. We could have looked at sugar, chocolate, beef, chicken. Nearly anything we eat is going to be connected in some way to these global webs. While the, the, the globalization of our food brings with it a host of benefits, right? We get uh, lower prices, we get greater availability of food outside of traditional growing season, we have more consumer choice. It also comes with a number of costs. And so the, the question I think for me is sort of how can we or can, can we, and if so, how do we continue to enjoy some of these benefits while we remove or reduce some of the, the costs associated with it, right? How do we maximize the benefit and minimize the costs? One of the real problems, I think, is that there are there are a lot of imperfect solutions, but there's no perfect ones, right? There's a lot of maybe less bad choices, but very few good choices, if you like. It's unlikely that that many of us could or should uh, grow our own food, right? Growing food is difficult, time-intensive work. It requires a lot of specialized knowledge to be effective. Just growing our own food, while while you know educational and 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 even enjoyable, is probably far less productive than relying on professionals to do it for us. Gardening may supplement our income, but for the vast majority of us, it's unlikely to replace trips to the grocery store, um, particularly for folks who live in larger cities and so on. Making better food choices can certainly help. Uh, shopping from local food producers through farmers markets or community supported agricultural schemes uh, has a number of benefits, particularly around keeping money within the community, providing local, uh, you know, in increasing uh, local development and, and, and uh, welfare, and reducing the number of miles that our food travels. 
they also help to shorten the distance, right, that we talked about earlier in the food system. So they, they connect us more directly to the sites of production and consumption and therefore probably have some uh, good environmental spinoff effects. Fair trade uh, is often promoted as an example of, of a way that we can sort of uh, rethink the relationship with food under fair trade systems. Farmers who grow the food usually receive a higher and, and almost always a more stable price for their crops. They, they receive guaranteed minimum prices that they, that they know the price of the final commodity won't f- fall beneath. Uh, and if global market prices go be above that, they'll receive that plus a, usually a small um, premium. These systems, right, are important because they provide that that stability. They insulate the farmers from from the fluctuations that we see in in uh, food commodity prices. Uh, and they also fair trade systems also usually include a community development element that promotes local health and education, often building schools and these sorts of things, all financed through the slightly higher uh, fair trade premium that that the final consumer pays. Importantly, the the fair trade systems that we see often address the problem of distancing largely through the reintroduction of floor prices and this idea that we're connecting the final consumer more directly with the, with the with the original producer we're reducing the number of steps in the production process but in the longer term i think the the stability of our food system likely requires some more fundamental or radical transformations uh, that are rooted both in the idea of re-regulation of the food economy and decommodification of food itself i think rethinking our relationship with food is one that's not rooted primarily in the market mechanism of supply and demand Uh, but instead is rooted in a a conception of food as a basic human right, Um, would go a long way, of course, towards ending the problems of hunger and malnutrition, promote respect for farmers, and address a number of the environmental challenges associated with agricultural production that we've talked about, as well as ensuring a a more sustainable and just food system. I think I'm going to leave it there for now, and I'm happy to chat and answer any questions uh, that you've got.